All right, I think we'll we'll get started here. Um, hopefully those who join in after will be able to catch up to us. But uh, thanks again for everyone who's taken the time out of your day to join us. My name is Trent Beatty from iWave, uh, and we're joined today uh, by Ian from Winspire, who's going to lead us through the bulk of the presentation and, uh, today. Before I handed things over to Ian, I did just want to say thanks again for, for joining us and spending the time uh, and just kind of give you some idea of what we're going to what we're going to cover today. So uh, in the next 45 minutes or so, we wanted to share some information with you and um, and just share some thoughts about how your organization can use events uh, as more than just events. Um, so that's a, a bit of a an abstract comment, but Ian's going to share some more details around that um, where where we've got ways and, and means to use those events and the activities that go into planning and organizing and executing those events so that they're not just one-time things uh, and then they can actually benefit your organization um, in an ongoing manner in more than just uh, a financial capacity. So um, as we go through things today, as I mentioned, Ian's going to lead us through the bulk of the, uh, the, uh, of the session. And as we wrap things up, we'll kind of connect some dots for you between iWave and Winspire, uh, and actually invite you to join in with us as we're going through uh, sharing a bit about your own organizations. Um, and we'll also invite you as a follow-up to uh, dive in a little bit deeper with us uh, later on in, in the summer. So with that, um, Ian, if we can kind of get moving through, um, just wanted to share with the, the group a little bit about iWave. Uh, so I think many of you are, are familiar with iWave, but for those who are not, iWave is about fundraising with confidence. Um, and as part of that, you know, uh, we've got lots of, of friends in the community like Winspire, who we like to engage and come together with to share some thoughts and share some ideas uh, to help all the organizations that we work with um, in their fundraising capacity. And really, when we think about what iWave's purpose uh, or we think about iWave's purpose and fundraising with confidence, the question usually comes up, what does that really mean? Uh, and iWave is focused on really one thing that's broken into three parts, and that is asking the right person or the right people for the right amount uh, at the right time. And all of those things depend on knowing as much as possible about those folks that we may be approaching or you may be approaching um, from a fundraising and uh, and fundraising um, strategy and a fundraising capacity. So again, we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we roll through things today. Um, but wanted to share a little bit of background on iWave. So we've been doing this for just about 30 years, um, helping organizations of all kinds of shapes and sizes in the nonprofit and higher education space do just this, uh, finding as much information as possible about those people um, and or organizations that they want to engage uh, and giving them confidence in the conversations that they that they have and that they um, need to have in order to facilitate their fundraising activities. So I won't spend a lot of time. I do want to make sure that Ian has time to cover the, the real meat of the, the conversation today, which is how we really leverage events and, and what can events do for us beyond that specific point in time um, uh, in terms of the activity and what that activity can can draw out for us in our organization. Great. Awesome. Thanks for that, uh, Trent. And, and thanks again for the opportunity for, um, you know, let me share uh, what we've learned about event fundraising uh, you know, out there in the real world. So for those of you who um, aren't familiar with the Windspire, what we do is we obsess over uh, fundraising events and particularly the live and silent auction. We provide donor travel experiences uh, on a no risk basis. So travel packages you don't have to pay for to use uh, and include in your event. Um, you simply offer them to your audience and then um, you can sell them at a profit for your organization and then you come purchase it from us after and only if they, they actually sell and raise money. And then we're a full service travel agency. So we take uh, great care of your winning bidders to make sure they have an incredible experience and, uh, and return year after year to your event to, uh, to keep buying those packages. So we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, this today, actually how you can use our experiences 
to identify those high net worth donors once they are at your event, because uh, that's a huge part of why events are such an important part of uh, of your of your fundraising mix. So um, again, check out our catalog. We have about 200 unique experiences out there, free to reserve for your event. You can sell as many times as you can, and then you keep all proceeds above the nonprofit cost. Uh, we've been at it for a while. Not, we haven't been at it for 30 years like uh, like iWave has and, and Trent, but uh, we've been uh, raising money for nonprofit causes since 2008 uh, with our experiences. Uh, we're just shy of $55 million uh, raised, and uh, we've been in over 48,000 uh, events globally, and we've serviced over 91,000 satisfied winning bidders, and those numbers are growing every day. So um, we're, we're a travel agency that just absolutely loves our, our role in helping nonprofits uh, raise more money at their events. So as, as Trent kind of uh, you know, summarized for me, uh, we are going to be talking today about how to use events to identify these, these high net worth donors. And um, breaking it down, uh, just to kind of summarize real quick, we're going to talk about events as lead generators, what that means, how you can go about promoting your event to get the right people to, uh, to actually attend. And then uh, once they're there, how do you identify those, those key donors uh, that you don't already know or have a relationship? And then finally, uh, after the event, the, one of the most crucial parts that is often overlooked is that post-event follow-up. Uh, how do you start building that relationship with those key donors um, and, uh, and turn them into recurring donors? So uh, let's get to it. Before, before we do, though, I always like to start these uh, presentations with a little poll. Um, I want to know if, uh, from those of you guys out there, what is the revenue goal for your next big event? Maybe you have an event coming up this this fall or, or early next spring, um, and I want to know. So I'm going to go ahead and put this poll out there. Uh, you'll see it on your screen. Is it less than $100,000, 100000 to $250,000, 250 to 500 or is it more than $500,000? Or maybe you don't set a revenue goal. Maybe you don't necessarily have a big event coming up. Um, in which case you can you can answer that. But I'm going to let you guys answer here. We have about 60% voted. Uh, give it about three more seconds. Three, two, and one. All right, let's close the poll and share some results. Okay, great. Uh, we have a good kind of uh, wide breadth of, of people out there. Um, some smaller events, which is great. I mean, these are exactly why you have these events is not only to raise money and uh, but I kind of bring in some of those bigger donors. Uh, what, what do you think about this here, Trent? Yeah, I think it's interesting. And, and um, you know, I also think that you know, the numbers you put up here don't necessarily um, indicate how many events some, some organizations may do. So there may be some folks who are, you know, making up that, that less than 100,000 that may be doing multiple events through the year. So um, at the end of the day, I think what it shows us is that events are a big part of organizations strategy and so I hopefully we've got some some nuggets in what Ian's going to share with us as we go through this afternoon. That's great. Yeah, and, and hopefully some of the nuggets will help those, you know, revenue goals start to increase a little bit, maybe get you into that next bracket if you're below 100,000, getting it above that $100,000 threshold or, you know, if you're below 250, getting it up up into that next one. So, uh thank you so much for sharing. That's great to Great to learn. Uh, we have one more poll. Uh, I want to know also what is your typical attendance for your annual gala? Um, that maybe that same big event. Uh, I'm going to launch this poll right here. Is it less than 150 people? 150 to 250, 250 to 500, more than 500 people. Maybe you don't host a gala. Let us know. We have about 60% voted right now. I'm going to wait for it to come on in. Just a few more seconds. Three, two. And one. All right, let's share some results. Interesting. Oh, this is fascinating. Okay, great. So, well, we have a ton of, um, you know, kind of a majority of of events with less than, you know, a hundred or excuse me, a hundred thousand dollar revenue goal. We still have a lot of events that have that that kind of average attendance of between two hundred and five hundred people. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that today in terms of the uh, relationship between how many people you have in your event. And, uh, and and how much revenue it's actually generating because uh, you know if you do it strategically and you're doing it correctly 
um, or, you know, I wouldn't say it's incorrectly to do it uh, certain ways, but if you're doing it strategically, uh, you can actually have less people at your event and raise more money if you are um, if you are promoting it correctly and and making sure that you're networking and making sure that the event is is really focused on on bringing those high revenue earn, earning donors to your event. Did you have a reaction to this uh, here, Trent? Yeah, similarly, and I think again it's that uh, as we'll see as we go through the content today, it's, it's the uh, the number of people, um, the alignment with the revenue, hopefully will be able to change that. Whether you have less people or more people, hopefully at the end of the day, the alignment uh, and the trajectory of revenue and people is all going upward. Correct. Yeah. All right. Moving on, let's talk about events as lead generators. And, and Trent, feel free to, to jump in here if you have any uh, any input throughout. Um, but what are we talking about in terms of events? I saw some people out there, uh, you know, we asked about the gala, but it's not necessarily the gala, right? There's plenty of events that you can be uh, hosting as an organization to to attract donors and and start enrolling them in your cause. And this by no means is not, a, or this by no means is a complete list, right? There's more events than just these. Uh, we have dinner galas, golf tournaments, run walks, social hours, happy hours, procurement parties. In terms of, you know, actually getting auction items in your local community. Um, that's kind of a, a, a thing that we've been talking about for a couple of years now. And we, we've, we've learned a lot about, um, you know, uh, about getting people together to, to help uh, expand, expand your reach in terms of building those experiences. A lot of them can be kind of table captain parties, those sorts of things. Uh, for today's purposes, in terms of identifying high net worth donors, uh, you can do them at pretty much any event, but these three, the golf tournaments, the dinner galas, your really intimate social hour, happy hours, are gonna be the key areas, key key events that you can use to, to really start enrolling those high net worth donors into your cause and uh, and really getting them to, to, to buy in. So uh, it's, when it comes to each of the, these events, I like to start by talking about creating an event community, right? So you want, people to um, know about your event and feel like they're missing out if, if they're not there, right? Uh, so you want to define that event community. Who are you going after? What, here are some signs that you've created a sense of community. Your event shows up on the social calendars of C-suite level individuals, right? You make people feel like they need to be there because they're connected, right? You're giving them a, a place where they can go um, they can go make more connections in their network, right? If you can create a, a an event where that's happening, people are going to be a lot more apt to to you know start coming and get that snowball effect, some momentum. Um, where if you if if they see that other people they want to meet are going to be there, then they're they're sure it's going to be there as well. So uh, people should feel like they're a part of something bigger than themselves, right? And if your event is the it place to be for the movers and shakers in your community, then then you're starting to win. Right. It's, uh, and I'll talk about. Um, yeah, I'm just going to leave it there for a second. Uh, so who are those movers and shakers? Right. It's about attracting the right people to your event. It's it's uh, it's business owners. It's entrepreneurs. It's corporate executives. It's community and civic leaders uh, from your community. And doctors and lawyers are also a, a key uh, demographic just simply because they're they're wealthier. Right. They they have money to spend and, and they have causes that they believe in. Right. So th this should be your focus when you think about who do I want to get to uh, my event from my local community. Right. And, and it's important to be strategic about how you're going to go get those people. And what I was about to say on the previous slide is it's not about selling the most tickets. I, I hear that time and time again. And I see people fall into this, tra this trap. Right. Where they just think if they get if they get the most people there then that is going to translate into the most dollars. Well, what we saw actually in the, in, the, in the survey is that's not always the case, right? You can have these tremendously huge events that don't necessarily bring in a ton of dollars because people aren't necessarily there for the cause, right? You know, instead of dropping $30,000 on a band that you think everyone in your community is going to love and, and come to your event, um, you know, spend that money, spend those resources on building relationships, networking, trying to find those and, and targeting and being strategic about the people that you go after because fewer highly qualified guests, um, you know, highly qualified donors is better than just a, a whole lot more people simply coming off the street, right? So um, instead of thinking about how many tickets can we sell, it's more accurate and, and more worth your time to be who should be selling our, who should we be selling our tickets to? I hope that makes sense. Um, so of course, you know, selling your tickets, you should be, your objective is to cover the cost of your event. Um, but, you know, at, at some point, there's a point of diminishing returns where, you know, 
your tickets should not be your main revenue driver, right? It's it's uh, it's it's simply to cover costs. The, the the point is to get the right people into the room who are then going to spend the money to support your cause. And and we talk about uh, I mentioned a couple times already about enrolling people in your cause, right? That's so important to so you're targeting these people. You want to highlight the fun, right? So many people uh, go to these events because they are fun, right? So you want to make sure people. Are going to have a good time when they be there but you also want to keep the reason for the event at the forefront that is so crucial i, I see so often people focus too much on the fun and the decorations and the ball and the, the whole you know fun aspect of it but you know you always want to follow that up right on its heels with the reason the cause the mission what are we doing it for what are we trying to accomplish and the person who, who said it best was actually lynn page who's uh, we did a webinar with earlier this year and she's the director of national events, or excuse me, national director of special events for JDRF. And they do 82 events per year. They raise over $70 you know, million dollars, uh, for JDRF. And, uh, and she talks about what you should be communicating uh, in, the, in the lead up to your event. You wanna talk about what is the mission and goal of the event, and it should be specific, right? Not just a general, hey, we're here to support X. What are you trying to, uh, finance with your with your with what you raise is it a building is it an initiative is it a certain number of people uh, beneficiaries covered through uh through this this event where does that so that leads right into number two where does that money go exactly right what is this money going to be funneled into and how is it going to support uh the cause and the people that and and things that uh that are the beneficiaries right why is it important okay just saying where it's going to go that's one thing, then following that up with, why does that matter, right? People wanna feel like their money is going towards something that, that creates an impact. So communicating that uh, about why it's important and what it means to the community at large, uh, or even back to the donors is, is so crucial. Um, number four, this one's huge, and I, I alluded to this in the very beginning, and this is where Winspire starts to come in. What auction items are gonna be available to purchase? This is so tremendously important, right? Uh, these high net worth donors, I'm going to talk about this a little more, uh, you know, t further on, but um, big ticket live auction items are going to attract high net worth donors. So these big trips to, you know, Europe or across the country or, uh, you know, access to things like backstage at Hamilton, these, these big, you know, unique experiences are going to, you know, catch the attention of, of those donors that you actually want to be at your event. So you want to be having that out there, promoting it on social media and, and such to, uh, to actually get them interested, right? And get them uh, interested in going. And then also talking about other high level guests or VIPs who are going to be there to draw them in, right? Show photos from previous events. Um, that it goes right back to that creating an event community, right? If they feel like it's gonna be a good networking opportunity and uh, they're gonna feel like they are missing out if they don't be there, uh, then that's gonna really start to start their engines to wanna, to wanna join. So these are, these are really five, really key points to in terms of what to communicate take a quick drink of water here um, promoting so that kind of goes this ties right into um, promoting your event I was debating whether to put Lynn's five points under promotion or, or you know as lead generators but I thought this was a good tie and then it's all about uh, your promotion right you know it's yes it's about getting the word out but it's more about that relationships, 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 right? Instead of, uh, you know, blanketing your community with, you know, flyers, spend that time. I mean, you should be having flyers out there, but make sure you're spending that time enlisting the help of your board to introduce uh, you to their Rolodex of contacts, right? People give to people who support great charities, right? I'm going to repeat that again. People give to people who support great charities. So it's all about the relationships and getting your board involved and assisting. So you're copulating more relationships um, because it's, and this is in a silver bullet. It's not like, okay, if you do, um, you know, you post this many times on social media and p print this many flyers, it's gonna be a silver bullet and you're gonna get all the right people there. It's it's a it's kind of the long game. It's tr it's strategy. It's it's finding out, putting on your detective's hat and finding out who you should be building those relationships with. And uh, the best place to start I mentioned it is, is starting with your board. If someone is on your board of directors, right, this is part of the job. And I, I can't tell you how often I hear about people complaining and, and you know about their board's involvement. And I totally get it how frustrating that can be, but it's 
they got to remind them that this is why they're on the board, right? It's, it's because of their Rolodex, it's because of their relationships, it's because they care. And if they care about your cause, then then they then it's important to um, encourage them, right, to open up their Rolodex and and key you in on who they are in their network uh, so that you can start building those relationships. That is where energy should be spent. Another great um, tip, this came from Danny Hooper. Uh, I talked to him last week, late last week. Uh, he's, a, he's a fabulous auctioneer uh, who's all over Canada and, and is down here in the United States. Uh, so an international benefit auctioneer, he's just a riot. Uh, but he recommends recruiting an honorary chair. I know this is very common up in Canada. I haven't heard about it as much down here, but I thought I'd, I'd bring the, the tip to you guys. Um, he says, I always recommend selecting a high profile person from the community to be an honorary chair. Their only expectation is they attend the event and they allow you to cultivate their network of contacts in your promotional efforts. This helps elevate the profile of your event and, and the cause that it's supporting, right? So um, finding that one person, they don't even have to come to your, your meetings, right? Your procurement meetings. It's just finding that person that, Hey, we're going to put you, we're going to put you all over the promotional materials. We're going to, um, if, you know, if you have a big network, we're going to be able to, to leverage that. Oh, my phone's ringing. And so this, I thought this was a really unique tip, uh, that, that could be useful for, for you, for you ladies and, and guys out there. Uh, he also had some really good tips for uh, selling corporate tables. That's a big part of event promotion. We talked about building relationships, networking. Uh, selling corporate tables is a big part of that, right? You go and solicit a business and, and ask them to buy a table. The, the key here is that you don't want them buying a table and then putting the tickets to the event by the water cooler, right, or the coffee machine. That's not going to get you the right people to your event, right? So it's really important when you're selling these corporate tables that you express your expectations and desire for qualified guests. And I thought he put it beautifully here. This was a, kind of a direct quote from him in terms of writing them a letter. If you get a yes, you know, an affirmation, we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and buy a table, that's great. Okay, now it's important to follow up with a letter, a phone call, right? Dear Bob, thank you so much for offering to purchase a table. If you're able, we would very much appreciate like-minded individuals who might support our cause. And this, this, uh, this passage here is really important. Every chair at our event is very valuable, but only if we have the right people in those chairs, right? And then provide some recommendations. You might consider inviting your suppliers, your golf buddies, your vendors, friendly competitors. Uh, this is actually something that, you know, businesses, if, if you get them thinking about it, right? These, these entrepreneurs, these business executives, if you get them thinking about it by providing some examples, then they can go actually start doing these things. But if you don't, then they, they won't really know. They'll, they'll think more about filling the table. They don't want to have an empty table, so they'll go just try to get butts and seats, right? But really coaching them on who to go solicit to to come to these events. And uh, Danny had a great point. It's actually uh, something that's very easy for these business people to kind of put pressure on their suppliers and their vendors and say, hey, you know, this is a cause that's really important to me. I would really appreciate seeing you there. And then guess what happens when those suppliers and those vendors who are, are getting business from this, this, this entrepreneur business owner, uh, they're going to want to impress them. Right. So they're going to come to the event and then they're going to want to spend money because they're going to do it in front of their, you know, this business owner, this this person who 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 they you know get business from. So um, the, the key point here is to just make sure you're coaching your table captains or your corporate table sponsors to on where they should be going to go go fill those seats. Promoting live auction items. Okay, I talked about this previously. This is uh, this is huge, right? So, uh, like I said, big ticket items attract high net worth donors, and uh, this is really where Winspire comes in because um, you know you have your live auction, um, and if you don't have a live auction, I highly encourage it. It's a it's a really great money maker. It's a great way to you know entertain people during dinner. Um, in addition to the fund and need, usually the live auction and the fund and need are kind of on the heels of each other. Um, but you know, while you have their attention and they're sitting down eating a meal, you want to have those live auction items out there because this is how you're going to identify those high net worth donors. And I'll talk about that in a second. But as far as promotion goes, right, it's, you know, when you're promoting on social media and through email, it's, you know, you want to be talking about the cause. You want to be talking about the event. You want to be talking about who's going to be there. But 
having these amazing live auction items to promote is just such a huge, uh, you know, very enticing thing for people to see when they're on social media. You can post these pictures of, of New York, of California, of wine country, of, you know, Paris, of, you know, the CMAs, the Country Music Awards, what have you, you know, Tuscany, those are things that people like to see on their newsfeed, right? And click on and like and interact with and say, ooh, ah, oh. these are the things that if you are conditioning people and preparing them to bid on these items when they get to the event, they're gonna end up bidding a whole lot more. You can imagine the conversation that happens between, you know, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, uh, the night of the event, they had no idea that this, you know, um, you know, Napa Valley package was going to be there and they have this hushed conversation. Well, I want to go. Well, no, honey, I'm not sure. You know, that's a, it would be a much different conversation if three weeks before the event, they see this package posted on social media or in their email inbox or on a poster at your local grocery store and say, oh my gosh, we're going to this event. Look at honey, they have a, a Napa Valley trip. Oh honey, I want to go uh, to Napa Valley. That's going to then start to condition them, prime the pump to, as soon as they walk in the door, they're ready to start bidding. Right, and that's a totally different situation, and you're going to end up generating a lot more dollars when you're promoting those those items before, and it's going to add credibility to your event. It's going to add that wow factor. People are going to say, "Wow, this thing's going to be huge. It's going to be fun." Right, as I alluded to before. So, promoting those live auction items is crucial. Scouting other events. I thought this was a, a great tip. I actually got from Ailey Byers, uh, who's up in the Northeast. She's a, a benefit auctioneer. She has a little quote uh, towards the end that I'll, I'll share as well, but scouting other events. Um, so going out and finding like-minded causes, right, in your community with major recurring donors. So you, this takes a little bit of detective work. This isn't a very glamorous part, but and it's a little bit of a sidestep from your actual event. But the fact is that major donors care about similar causes, right? If some, if a major donor, is, you know, donates to, for example, animal shelters, right? They may be interested in donating to, um, you know, these, these horse camps. These, um, oh my gosh, why am I forgetting the name of them? Um, the, the the horse therapy camps, right? Um, and so, if, if you have these major donors who care about these similar causes. And you can see, like, let's say they're, they're, they care about education. Well, there's a whole different, there's a whole swath of educational causes that you can support, right? So um, if you see them uh, supporting all these different causes, maybe they don't know you exist at all, right? So, uh, and the fact is, these events typically thank these large donors very publicly after their, their events. They post it on their event websites. So if you can go and do put your detective hat on and you can see events, you know, in Dallas, Texas, this person always gives above $10,000 to every other cause that's like yours, uh, except yours, right? Uh, you can go around the area and see, you know, who these philanthropists are uh, and then and go try to get on there, get them on your mailing list, right? Um, an important note here, right? This is, you don't want to be poaching, right? Because poaching is bad. Uh, so if you have an exact, a cause that's exactly the same, right? Animal Shelter A uh, has these big donors and your Animal Shelter B, uh, and you try to get these big donors to come, you know, donate to yours, that's poaching, right? That's bad. But if it's good, if you if you find donors from Animal Shelter A and you inform them about you know a horse rescue in town in the same town, you know that's that's similar but different, right? It's about animals. It's about um, you know they 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 support these similar causes. Uh, so that that's something where you can do your research and and potentially find out uh, who these major donors are that uh, that you should be going after. So uh, I can't I want to reiterate no poaching, right? But if, if you put your detective hat on, you can go out and actually find people in your community who are these major donors who haven't been coming to your event. Maybe they just don't know you exist yet. Um, so I thought that was a really, really cool little tip. All right, we're at the night of the event. How do we identify those wealthy donors? Now, before we get into uh, kind of some of the tactics, uh, the night of the event, uh, the, the, one of the most important things you can do is make sure you are collecting information on every single guest. And this has actually become a whole lot easier these days with the, you know, introduction of mobile bidding, kind of, it's, you know, it's a lot more widespread. So people end up uh, registering as they walk into the event, which is great. But if you don't do mobile bidding and it's, you know, paper and pen, just make sure that you are registering people as they get there or as they're sitting down, they're filling out bid cards, uh, incentivize them to give you your information because this is going to be very, very important later. Uh, which I'll talk about, um, especially with regard to Trent and iWave, uh, why it's so important to get the contact information. It's, you know, name, email, 
phone number are, are the three most, most crucial. Uh, but if you can get company name, you know, job title, those are also going to be huge indicators for qualifying these donors later on. Once you're at the event, be observant, right? It's really important as the event organizer or development director, maybe you're an executive director, that you aren't wasting your time on the little things, right? Delegate those things so that you can be present the night of the event and be looking around, head on a swivel, talking to people and being observant, right? You want to take note. Who is well-dressed, right? This might sound superficial, but pay attention. Who's well-heeled, right? Look at the handbags, the shoes, the ties, the dresses. Uh, and if there's people that are, you know, extremely well-dressed that you uh, don't know yet, it might be good to go, you know, try to get an introduction, right? Who are they talking to, right? People tend to gather in the same socioeconomic circles. So if you know that a major donor is there and they're talking to, you know, a group of five or six people uh, and there's a few of them in there that you don't know, then, you know, it's it's in your best interest to go try to, to get another inter introduction. Now, you'll see that little caveat there about the who is well-dressed. I wanted to make sure that I put this out here. Don't always read a book by its cover because there might be people who are extremely well-dressed who are not the kind of people that you want to be talking to, right? There might be people who are not well-dressed who are exactly the kind of person you want to be talking to because, you know, not everybody uh, flaunts it. So, um, you know, I kind of have talked, I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth right now, but um, it's just it, the crucial part here is for you to be observant and not get lost in the details. Standing in the back, you want to be out on the floor observing people, talking to people, trying to facilitate introductions, especially, you know, before the live auction, before dinner and afterwards. Using the live auction, all right, right back to this point. The, the key point here with the live auction, of course, you have those, those you know, live auction items that you've been promoting, getting people excited. Uh, then it's the live auction happens, right? The, the best thing you can do, right, is to write down the bid numbers of every person who bids above a certain amount. And that certain amount changes from, you know, community to community, depending on the, you know, uh, the you know socioeconomic wealth, but um, the, the key point is here is like who would you rather take out to the following week? A person who bid three hundred dollars on a gift basket, or the person who bid three thousand dollars on a on a big travel experience, right? And that's why Winspire experiences and live auction items are such a key tool in identifying these key donors, right? Because you might have forty four people bid uh, on everything over three thousand, but they've never given you money. Maybe they they're underbidders. Maybe they never win right? Who are they? Let's track them down and talk to them. You could have three or 400 bidders on each item who's been bidding every single year, but they've never won, right? But you've never had an excuse to talk to them because you didn't know that they were so active unless you're writing down the bid numbers, right? So, uh, you know, depending on how you facilitate the live auction, just make sure you have someone that is, is up in front uh, watching the audience and writing down numbers of people who bid and the amounts they bid if you can, right? Um, this is also why it's so crucial to have enough live auction items. Um, the live auction, this, you know, we recommend having no less than seven big ticket live auction items, right? And if there, if you have some consignment items in there, that's a great way to ensure that you're reaching that, that, that seven items. Uh, typically we, you know, we say between seven and 12. And the reason is, is you can get through seven live auction items extremely fast. Most good auctioneers or people who've done it before can get through an auction item in about three to four minutes right? So if you do 10 live auction items, that's that's half an hour, right? That's that's more than enough time. Uh, you have more than enough time during dinner to to offer these live auction items and get people bidding, get people excited. Um, so again, I can't iterate this enough, reiterate this, is that live auctions, they're not only great revenue earners, right? They bring in a lot more money because of the higher value of the items, people end up bidding more and ends up bringing in more revenue but they also are great for identifying donors. And that's why it's so important to have enough live auction items in your event so that you know you can see who's gonna be bidding and who's gonna be active. And, and the best part about consignment, right, is if no one bids or you don't reach your minimum bid amount, you don't, it doesn't cost you a thing, but you can still see if, hey, you know, there's people who are, are interested or not, right? So I have some examples of here, some just great live auction items. Puppies always go for crazy amounts, hotel stays, vacations. Uh, about half of these, uh, about two thirds of these are, are um, Winspire experiences. Um, and, and again, it's, it's just why it's such a great tool. Here's a tip from uh, Scott Robertson. Talk to him um, at length about this, and and he re reiterates this this point I made about just making sure you have key staff members up front during the live auction so they can watch the faces of the bidders and see who is getting excited about which items, 
which uh, and because this is going to inform your development team and your procurement team for future events uh, he said but just make sure that you're off to the side right not in the spotlight because it's distracting people will, will think twice about bidding if you're standing up on stage with the auctioneer you know staring around writing uh, you know notes down you kind of want to be off to the side kind of maybe uh, you know beside the speakers uh, kind of in the shadows almost just just but make sure you see the faces of of your bidders because you'll be able to learn a lot by who gets excited about what right the last thing you want to be is is in the back right looking at backs of heads um you know getting lost and tying up loose ends like he says here all too often staff are trying to tie up loose ends during the live auction and missing the value completely the live auction should be used for identifying those high net worth donors all right so the live auction happened now it's time to go introduce yourself right uh, just had some interesting tips from from all the auctioneers I talked about. Uh, you know, your your job as the development director or event chair even is to to not be shy. You have to go build those relationships now. And if you start keying in on some people at the event that that you want to start rolling in your cause, then you got to go introduce yourself, right? Uh, this is a really easy uh, kind of I thought funny tip from Ailey Byers. I should have put her quote a little bit sooner. So you see, her, she has a slide next here, but uh, a really easy way to introduce yourself is just to compliment people on their attire and uh, she said try to find a well-dressed woman right and actually compliment their husband or their partner on their on their sh shoes or suit right um you'd be surprised how will this work you can say i really like your suit shoes tie of course your wife looks stunning gorgeous but i bet you never get complimented on your suit and you'll, as she said, you always get a response, no, your wife, or the wife says, I, I picked that out. Of course, it's my style, right? And then you're starting the conversation on a kind of a laughing, uh, laughing way. So you want to use it to start a conversation about the mission and the auction items. Like, you know, I saw you guys were uh, participating. What do you think, right? The more information you can find out about them so you can, uh, you know, start building that relationship, the better, right? Start asking about, do they care about the cause? You want to ask about their involvement, right? Uh, find out how they can get there and, and, and what they or how they got there, who invited them, uh, what their relationship with the cause is. So you can start to vet them kind of very quickly as, okay, is this someone I want to start to get to know? Uh, or is this someone I can, you know, politely excuse myself, say, have a great time and I can move on to the next target, right? Uh, if you're kind of worried about uh, introducing yourself to people, you can always enlist the help of a board member. Board members are typically very well connected. Um, they, you know, have... You know, hopefully no problem uh, introducing themselves to people, especially your major do donors. So, uh, you know, if there's a group of people you want to get uh, introduced to, uh, a great way to, to get in there is just to go grab a, a board member by the arm and say, hey, you know, I think it'd be really beneficial if we could go talk to these folks and, uh, and team up with them to go facilitate that introduction. And hopefully, um, hopefully, if you guys have any questions, um, you're, you're typing them in. We'll be having a Q&A session here at the end. Uh, but this is Ailey Byers. Uh, she's the one who talked about complimenting the, the men's suits. I thought it was great. Um, but she talks about after the event, right? She likes to approach guests who were active in the live auction but didn't win and thank them for bidding. And she'll kind of josh them. She'll say, you know, what would have made you bid again? You were so close, kind of joking around to get them to know them a little better and, and really gauge their interest. And, and this is a really important point, point. If they say, you know, I really didn't think it was worth that much, then it's not about the money, right? If you can find out that people were bidding and, you know, they have kind of an attitude towards the auction item, then that doesn't mean that they that means they might have actually mo more money to spend, right? So uh, unless they say, you know, hey, you know, this is out of my budget or that sort of thing, um, you know, it's kind of these subtle things that you can say or questions that you can ask to try to figure out, okay, do these people have uh, the resources to to come back maybe next year or to our next event and spend more money if we put better auction items in front of them, right? So trying to find out their interests, get their relationships, um, all of that is gonna is gonna really kind of give you those subtle hints about who you should be going after. Post event follow up. This is such an important part that um, you know it, it it pains me to have to keep reminding people, but it's amazing how many events. Uh, where it happens where people don't get thanked properly, right? Um, you know, you should be saying, sending a thank you to absolutely everyone, first of all, whether it's just kind of an automated email, uh, but I, you know, personally, I think it's important to have a, a personal touch on every single thank you that, that you have, right? But the, especially those donors who bid, bid above a certain amount, and it could be $1,000, it could be $2,000, uh, it could be 5,000, but, uh, you know, personally contacting them with a phone call 
a handwritten thank you letter saying thank you so much for X donation, um, reminding them about you know what it's going to impact, and then you know the, the really big donors sending them something extra like a bottle of wine or a, a picture of, of of someone that they're gonna they're gonna help. Um, you know, just that personal touch goes such a long way to help people feel like they're getting enrolled in the cause and and really you know, want to become a recurring donor. Um, so I can't stress this enough. I know you guys have heard it a thousand times, but just um, if you're trying to build those relationships, uh, those personal touches are, are such an important part. And, and I wanted to finish, you know, what I was going to say here with just building that relationship, right? You want to be taking them out to lunch, um, invite them to social gatherings. We talked about those uh, procurement parties, social hours, having a little bit more intimate event where you can invite them um, and, you know, start and talking to them about the cause and introducing them to people, the board members, um, building that relationship is going to turn them into those repeat donors. So um, that's such a crucial part. And um, with that, I want to hand it off back to Trent because we talked about collecting information at the very beginning, which is such a crucial part. And here, post-event is where it really comes into play, right? You want to send those thank yous and you want to start building the relationships. Uh, but the best way to figure out who you should be doing that with, right, especially the, the building relationships part of inviting them out, out to lunch um, is really assisted by by enriching the data, right? Finding out more details about these people who attended your, your event. Uh, did you wanna uh, speak a little bit to that, Trent? Yeah, thanks Ian, and I think you've kind of summarized it pretty well, but you know, just kind of connecting the dots between you know, what Ian's, Ian's gone through and where iWave fits in and why we wanted to kind of work together uh, in this message is, you know, as you think about the, the, two, the two topics or the two um, tools here. We've got you know, events, and we've got um, the, the packages that Winspire can can provide for a, an event as a means of gathering information and gathering data. Um, you know, I don't want to I don't want to dehumanize it too much, but you know, at the end of the day, we're trying to collect as much information as we can to fuel your ongoing um, research and fundraising intelligence. So if we think about you know, that event, again, is being more than just a single activity or a single event, um, using, using the term to define the term. Um, it's about gathering information from that event that we can use on an ongoing basis. Uh, and so if we think about it, I guess, a couple of different angles, actually, you know, getting the information uh, from the bidders who are, who are bidding and certainly the winners, uh, but those that are raising, you know, raising their bid cards, um, being able to use that that contact info as a means to determine who to follow up on or who to follow up on following which strategy. You know, when we look at, uh, yeah, Ian, we can, we can go to the, the slide. So as we look at the kind of the, the pictorial in front of you, it brings together a, a key concept um, that iWave is built upon and it's really what we call the three keys. So knowing, uh, knowing all the different angles about your um, about your constituents. And certainly, you know, someone's attendance at a gala uh, or willingness to buy a table or be a table captain uh, of a gala or an event may be a great indicator of capacity. Um, their attendance at an event may also be, um, you know, an indicator of an affinity. They've got some interest in, in your cause or your particular uh, objective. Um, and the other piece in that equation is often propensity. So, you know, when we think about all these things together, is really how we find or how we do you know, help you find the the very best prospects from a fundraising perspective. So, kind of maybe maybe re um, uh, reorganize those thoughts. I just tried to convey. You know, looking just capacity alone, the fact that somebody you know may have bid on and won a particular you know high value uh, auction item doesn't necessarily mean they're a great philanthropic prospect for you. Uh, and so just because someone's at your event doesn't mean that they're a great prospect for you. The fact that they're there, the fact that they won, and the fact that you may also be able to map that information up with whether or not they've given to other organizations or they've given to your organization in the past starts to create a much more complete picture. And again, that's really what we're, we're trying to do is enable you to have a, the most complete picture of your constituents, whether they be your existing donors or they be your prospective donors that you're you're looking to develop a relationship with, knowing as much as possible enables you to have confidence 
um, as you're going out on that, that fundraising activity. So um, with all that said, you know, before we open it up uh, for Q&A, I just wanted to, um, to give everyone the heads up. We're going to follow up uh, today's, uh, today's webinar with a part two. So coming up in September, uh, we're going to get a little bit deeper into those three keys and how those three keys can work um, and how iWave data can help facilitate the unlocking of, uh, of the details behind um, those three keys. So stay tuned for those details. I'm sure you will all get invites because you showed up here today, uh, but hopefully you can make it to dig into the, to the next step here as well. Um, so Ian, any other comments before we, we jump into some of the questions that are coming in for us? No, yeah, we'd love for all of you to join us uh, for part two. It's uh, coming up September 5th on Wednesday. It's going to be around the same time. Uh, we'll definitely be sending out some invites here coming up. Um, but yeah, this, you know, it's been, been a lot of fun partnering with I iWave on this on this webinar because, um, you know, that's really what events are for. People get so focused and hyper-focused on, you know, the bottom line, which is really important. But at the end of the day, you know, your job as, as fundraising professionals, as development directors, as event chairs, is to try to facilitate those recurring donors, uh, which is what events can really, really help do. So um, just wanted to touch, before we get to Q&A real quick, uh, again, check out our catalog uh, at winspireme.com for no risk travel packages so you can really round out that live auction offering. We're actually giving away a, uh, a $1,200 travel package uh, if you subscribe to our blog. So you can go to winspireme.com backslash giveaway. Uh, we do a, a drawing once a quarter, so definitely check that out. We, we're doing a drawing actually um, right now for, for this quarter's. Um, so uh, definitely check that out. We're always coming out with new new details. Um, we also have a podcast that uh, that I put together with a couple colleagues of mine, Danny Hooper, who I mentioned during the, the webinar, a uh, great auctioneer. He's hilarious. And then Renee Zhao, the founder of Donation Match, which is a great service. Uh, so check it out with eventswithbenefits.com. So um, thank you, Trent, for uh, for partnering with me on this, this webinar. And with that, I, I thought I'd open it up for, for some questions. Um, let's see. This was a good one. Um, some, this is from uh, May Lynn Henry. Some of our donors are disappointed when we use Winspire because they want 100% of their donation to go to the cause. What recommendations do you have about how to handle this conversation? So first off, totally get it. Um, you know, what I would first say is, is uh, you know, there's expenses that are associated with every event, right? You have to pay to use the venue. You have to pay to get the catering, right? There, you make an investment right into the event to get a return and that's exactly what consignment items are uh, it, it gives you the ability to put these incredible big ticket unique items in your live auction that that you simply can't procure yourself or it's extremely difficult to um, and you don't want to be playing you know uh, you know travel agent on the on the back end of the event you want to move on to planning the next one so that's what we do is we facilitate the whole, whole experience afterwards so talking about events in terms of investment and return uh, you know people will start to understand that the second thing is uh, securing underwriters for packages so a lot of places out there have a known consignment policy uh, or things you know where they you know they have this experience with, with bidders where people aren't happy because they realize that 100% isn't going to the, the cause, but you can actually get people in your community to, to actually underwrite the cost of a travel package. And it's especially good for doctors and lawyers who might not have a service or a product that they can donate to the, the silent auction or the live auction. Uh, you can say, hey, you know, why don't you um, underwrite the cost of this, you know, $3,500 uh, Napa Valley package they'll get recognized during the live auction right everyone will stop the auction they'll say hey the following packages was donated by you know mr and mrs smith here in the front row everyone gives a round of applause and then the bidding's off and then 100 percent of the proceeds actually go to your cause and the the doctor or lawyer or whomever donated the package gets to see their initial investment of say 3500 dollars go much higher than that so they're happy donors are happy everyone's happy it's a really good way to kind of circumvent that that 100 donated uh, objection there so thanks for that question, Maylin. Um, Pay Peg McCleskey. Oh, is e um, equine therapy. That's that was the horse therapy thing that I didn't uh, didn't get down. So thank you for that. Um, Cindy DeForge, do you recommend doing the fund of need before or after the live auction? It's it's funny. There is a debate going both ways on this. So I I'm personally not an authority on that. Uh, I've seen it done both ways. Um, I you know I've seen it done 
very successfully before the fund I need before the live auction. I've also seen it done after, and I've you know there's there's uh, there's arguments to both. What I would say is the only thing not to do is to have the fund need in the middle of the live auction because that breaks up the continuity. It's awkward. It doesn't quite work. Uh, so just commit to either having it before or after. I've seen it work really well both ways. And the other thing you got to make sure that you do is before the fund and need, um, you have that 30 to 60 second um, speech or video uh, from, you know, that talks about the cause and really gets the oxytocin going in their brains, gets people a little bit teary eyed and, and really, you know, gets them ready to, to donate money. Uh, that's such a crucial part of having your fund to need and your live auction because people are reminded about why they're giving their money. And, uh, you know, I've seen performances instead of that. And that is where you really, you know, if you have a tap dance performance by the executive director's daughter, that's not a good thing to do right before the fund to need because people aren't going to remember about why they're giving, right? So having that introduction Reduction by the, you know, a speech, make sure it's short, you no know, longer than 90 seconds, um, or video that gets people ready to go is, is, is the most important part. What's less important is, is what the order is, whether the, the fund and goes before or after. Uh, so thank you for that, Cindy. Um, Kathy Dowd, when you have no control over marketing, how do you handle a marketing department who continues to put your event on the back burner? Ooh, I, you know, I don't know uh, if I have an answer for that. Do you, do you, uh, I, I don't have any experience um, with events who actually hire a marketing department. Do you, Trent? Well, I would, I would say, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to <laughs> blow too much, uh, you know, um, smoke uh, around Windspire, but I think just maybe sharing this, uh, this webinar with them. So totally. um, giving them, giving them a chance to look at, some of the things that Ian has brought to light. So a marketing department has got to be thinking about how do they, you know, how do they draw more attention to the cause and how do they draw, you know, higher level potential donors to the cause. Uh, and again, the reason we've kind of come together in this today is, is for just that, you know, being able to gather more people behind, uh, behind the cause, behind your activities, and also, you know, bringing, bringing people we don't know about um, to light. So maybe sharing, the webinar that we've just done today um, yeah. is a starting point. Um, but at the end of the day, all the organizations have their priorities and it probably depends a lot on what else is going on or what else they have on their plates for sure. Totally. I, yeah. And you, you bring, make a great point. I think giving them kind of specific actions that they can take, like, Hey, here's, you know, some auction items we're going to be promoting and telling, Hey, can you promote this on, you know, social media and an email campaign, uh, you know, giving them specifics about what you expect, uh, I think could be really helpful about getting them to, uh, to uh, not put your event on the back burner. Um, let's see here, Sandra, um, can we get slides to the presentation? Yes. I'll be sending them out after. Um, Let's see here. Stacy Montgomery, what is the role of table captain at a fundraising event gala? That's a great question. The table captains are in charge of uh, recruiting people, going out in, into the uh, community, right? And, and recruiting people to fill their tables, right? So um, these should be well-connected, uh, vibrant uh, go-getters who care about the cause and and know how to enroll people in the cause and, and get them psyched to come, right? So um, don't you don't want to put someone as a table captain if um, you know they're a little bit uncertain or uh, not sure about you know what their roles and responsibilities are, but uh, but give them specific goals and you can incentivize them as well. A great way to uh, make sure table captains are are filling those seats at those tables is to incentivize them to do so, and you can do that with um, items that you've gotten donated or uh, uh, you know we've even seen travel packages as you know small kind of hotel stays as. Uh, as incentives to to really get them to go out and, and recruit because what they're doing is they're recruiting new potential donors but just like corporate table sponsors you know you don't want them bringing you know just their family and their cousins and and you know just random people off the street uh, you want them to be leveraging their rolodex and their relationships to uh, you know find people that would be you know would care about your cause so uh, you know in, in favor of I'm more in favor of getting people, making sure the right people are appointed top table captains uh, instead of just getting a lot of table captains. You want to make sure that you get people who who care enough to to go do it correctly. Let's see. What is the best process for staying in touch with a prospective donor if an upcoming event is not in the near future? And this is from Sarah. Um, great question. 
um, you know, this is where, uh, you know, your, your social media, your email, and even and direct mail really come in handy, right? Posting periodic posts about your cause, about what the progress that you're making. Uh, if you had an event maybe last spring, still keeping people updated on where that money is being used, right? Sending periodic emails. You know, you can have your monthly email newsletter that just says, hey, you know, this is a reminder, you know, just a thank you for donating. This is where that cause or where that money has been going to, what it's accomplished, uh, what impact it's been making. Those those kind of five points from, from Lynn Page about, you know, the cause and why, why it's important and why it matters. Uh, keeping people updated and enrolled is, is going to be really important, right? So that they don't forget. And by the time that save the date comes back in the mail, they're, you know, they're excited about it and ready to go because they know that their money that they spent the last event actually went to good use, right? So the best thing you can do in between events is, is keep people up to date, uh, but just don't pester them, right? Emails once a week are too much. Um, you know, emails every three weeks are, are a little bit better. Um, and make sure that when you do send an email, it's informative, useful, and, um, you know, entertaining. Try to have fun with it. Thanks for that, Sarah. This is from Michael. We use the pledge drive uh, with Givergy during our gala. Would you still recommend having an auction, live, silent, uh, et cetera? Absolutely. So um, the way to think about events is um, in terms of revenue streams, right? You have an event and you have multiple ways of collecting money, right, at the event. So if you, you are only limiting yourself if you do one of them. So let's say you have the silent auction, the live auction, and the, um, and the fund and need right? If you only do the fund of need, right? You may, it may be a very successful fund of need, um, but you're not going to be picking up some of the, you know, bids that you may have gotten from folks who aren't able to contribute a lot in the fund of need, right? You want to give people something to do at all times during the event that is generating revenue. And the fund of need lasts for 20 minutes, right? But if an event is all evening, you want to make sure that there's things that are happening throughout the night that are generating revenue. The silent auction is a great thing to have during cocktail hour when people arrive, right? Selling raffle tickets, another great thing to have when people are arriving. Dinner time, while people are sitting and eating dinner, is a great time to do the live auction because it's entertainment, it's exciting, right? And so, and then after on the heels of that, the fun to need, right? Um, every single point in the night has some sort of fundraising revenue stream that is generating revenue. So only having one of them is limiting yourself, right? Now, that being said, you want to make sure that you're strategic about how you place those things and, and, and what you do. You don't want to have 300 items, or si items in the silent auction because that takes so much of your time to put together. You want to be, you know, you want to have not too many silent auctions. You want to have just enough live auctions, right, items, and you definitely want to have that fund and need. So if you don't have a fund and need in your event, um, I recommend having that. Hopefully that answered your question, Michael. Let's see. Marsha uh, Betstol, do you think having a matching grant at your event should take away the numbers of live auction items, or do you still go with seven items or more? Uh, that's a great question. I I can't stress enough the importance of having seven or more live auction items um, simply because, uh, you know, if you have three donated items, that's great, right? You want to make sure they're above a certain amount, um, but, you know, you're going to get some participation there if they're, if they're good items. Um, but having those consignment items that if they don't get any bids, it's okay. Like that's not, it, it's not, the, you don't, it doesn't cost you a thing. Right. But um, you know, it can't, it, it's something where you want to make sure that the items that you put in that live auction, not just, you just don't want to put, you know, an Xbox or, you know, flat screen TV, they should be really good items that are targeted to your audience interests. Right. Cause the last thing you want is to offer seven items and get zero bids for any of those items. Right. Um, you know, so it's important to do your research and be strategic about the items that you put um, out there, but you know, even if you have that matching grant and you have, um, you know, you think your fund of need is going to go off, you know, go crazy and people are going to participate in it. That's great. Um, but you're missing out if, you know, that fund of need only lasts for 20 minutes and you have, you know, you have these people's attention for four hours, right? Uh, you want to make sure that, like I said before, that there's a fundraise or a revenue stream coming in. And if you do it right, um, the, the most successful events out there, right, have a profitable silent auction, a profitable live auction, and a profitable fund of need. You have three revenue sources, right? It's because they did their strategy and they, they made sure that they had a good cluster of silent auctions that get a lot of bids. They don't have too many. They have just enough live auctions that cater to the interests of their audience. And then they have a fund of need that has a great 
pitch before, um, you know, you make that appeal and, and people want to participate. So, um, you know, reducing the number of, of live auction items doesn't necessarily make sense if you, if you can use that time, because uh, otherwise people are just going to be sitting and eating dinner and they're not going to be participating in anything, right? While you have their rapt attention, it's a great opportunity to put items in front of them that will hopefully get them to bid if you've done your job right, and you can start to identify those high net worth donors. Hey, and I just wanted to jump back to a question from Peg before we uh, we need to wrap up. So Peg asked the question about the, the quick definition of propensity and affinity. So um, Peg, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that's a great lead segue into part two of today's event, but I will give you a quick definition. We think about the, the three keys, capacity being one, propensity and affinity being the other two. Affinity is really a measurement of, of how connected somebody is to a particular cause. You know, are they interested in education? Uh, are they interested in animal welfare? Are they interested in, um, in human services? So being able to measure you know, where someone may be most connected or have the highest level of an affinity. And propensity is, is iWave's measurement of you know, somebody may have a ton of capacity, they may be very wealthy, but if they're not, they don't demonstrate a pattern of parting with that capacity, parting with their wealth, then they would have a very low propensity. So propensity measures, you know, how, how likely someone is to, um, to be philanthropic with their, with their wealth, with their capacity. So again, kind of marrying all, the, all three of those together. Do they have the ability to give? Do they have a history of giving? And do they care about our cause? Those are the three keys to finding a really great prospect. Love it. Yep. And sorry for missing that. Um, um, that's a great, great question and great answer there, Trent. Um, I, I have some more questions rolling in. You guys don't have to stick around if you don't like, but I wanted to to make sure I get a chance to to answer a few more of these. So, um, to, um, so I'm, I'm going to just roll on for a few more minutes here. Um, but to those few who got to go, I, I totally understand. So, um, is that is that okay with you, Trent? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I don't have a hard stop, so I will hang around as well. Um, and any, anyone who does need to leave, we, we can definitely follow up with you and, and make sure you get you get to your questions answered. We don't want to leave anybody in the dark, that's for sure. Totally. Um, this is a great question from uh, Nancy uh, DeBellis. We are a small nonprofit school and would like to establish a good fundraising ratio target. Um, I assume that's your expense ratio for the for the event and uh, a good kind of industry standard is is 30%. So for um, every dollar that you raise, 30 cents uh, goes to pay for the expenses of the event. Um, you don't you want to try not to get any higher than that. If you can keep it below 30, then you are doing uh, you're doing a great job. Did you do you have any uh, feedback on that, Trent? Yeah, I I really don't. I think you you would definitely be the uh, uh, the expert there. I don't have a great sense on what that ratio might look like. Got it. Okay. Uh, Danielle, Ali Kasim, can you give examples on how to make a newsletter exciting? Uh, that's a great question. Um, making sure that you have pictures, pictures of your cause, pictures of the people, pictures of the things that you're supporting, uh, is what people want to see, and then stats, very easily digestible statistics, right? Uh, how, how many people are being helped? Uh, how many how many you know how many acres are being saved uh you know how many dollars it take or how many meals per or how many dollars per meal um you know stats that can be easily digested um and that are direct results of of the money that is being spent at these events um or or just in general right keeping you know finding new and creative ways to present that data infographics are a fabulous way um you can typically go on things like upwork uh, which is a website where you can find people to you know create infographics for you you can give them a data set um white papers having a call to action things like uh, things that people can read or look at or interact with is just a great way to keep people um involved and, and keep those newsletters exciting yeah, and I, I would add to that that you know, keeping it personal as well. So totally. engaging and personal. So using your your network and using the folks that are, have been involved with your cause. So if we kind of go back to today's today's topic, if we've had an event and we've had some you know some winning bidders, we want to you know promote that. Um, and it doesn't necessarily need to be a gala event, but any activity that you've got going on surrounding your cause, making sure that you're sharing the people who have been involved and not necessarily the people who are working with the organization, but the people who are, um, you know, 
alongside of the organization. So making and building um, the, the wider network around your, your community and your organization. That's a great point. Personalization is key. Um, Kathy Dowd, what are your thoughts on pre-bid via website, uh, bringing the highest bid uh, to open that item at the event? Um, from what I have uh, learned with partnering with you know our, our bid, mobile bidding technology partners like uh, One Cause, formerly BidPal, uh, Greater Giving, and um, and um, you know Gesture uh, in particular, they they all say that it works great. And I, I've I've been a part of some events where I've I've done some pre bidding and it was a lot of fun. Um, it's a great way to get it's a great way to start the promotion of your event early, right? Get people you know you know instead of just posting these uh, pictures of auction items that are going to be there, allow people to start bidding on them early, um, particularly for the Samhain auction. I think it works really well. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense for the live auction, but for Samhain auction, great. I say go for it. Pre-bidding is a great way to kind of start the engines, right? Get people going. Um, and then you can talk about it the night of the event. Say, hey, we've had a lot of activity on this, this item. Uh, you can tell which items are going to be hot the night of the event. And so you can kind of start to anticipate and see um, and see what items are going to go. So um, I, I highly recommend it. I think it's a great thing. Thanks for that, Kathy. Uh, this one's from Dr. Uh, Mior Taylor. Uh, we are planning a golf tournament and plan a silent auction during the tournament. We will also have a dinner and a BBQ after, afterwards. Can you also have a live auction as well during the dinner? Maybe 10 to 15 high auction items live as well. Absolutely. I would say for a golf tournament, it's uh, and because it's a B, you know, BBQ, it's a little more informal. Um, you, know, you don't need as many live auction items. I would say maybe kind of four to five max. Um, and you know, golf tournaments are great for golf packages, right? If you want a trip to the Masters, the PGA, uh, what have you, uh, that's a great place to to auction those off. Um, and you know, golf trips, right? Going to St Andrews uh, in Scotland and uh, things of that nature are things are great, great things to auction off. But again, because golf tournaments are a little bit more informal, people are a little bit more exhausted by the end of the golf tournament. It's a little more difficult than you know the night of a. a, a gala where the energy is really high uh, to have that live auction. So um, definitely worth a try. Um, yes, to answer your question. <laughs> Thanks for that, doctor. And Sandra, can you explain the funded need further, please? Is this a call for funds to support the need of the organization? Yes, a funded need is uh, that comes, comes goes by a lot of different names. Funded, uh, funded need, special appeal, cash appeal, um, when I say fund a need is my favorite term because you're funding a specific need. It'll be fund a building, fund a playground, fund a, you know, rescue. Um, you know, you're talking about something very specific that people are then funding and it's a direct appeal to the audience during an event asking for um, direct donations. And typically you want to start high and then go low. And when you start high, you want to start with a, a pre-secured amount uh, from the audience that you know someone's going to uh, put their hand up. Because the last thing you want is to start it and then have nobody, have crickets in the room, right? You want to get the momentum going. So make sure you have a couple pre-secured bids at some of those high amounts. Uh, you can even do matching donations that, hey, if, if people, you know, we, you know, start at, you know, 20,000, you know, we get down to 15 and 10, um, you know, at 10,000, if we get, you know, or 5,000, and let's say if we get multiple bids, we're going to match the bidding, you know, for every bid we get, something like that. So you want to go down and typically you want to go down to, you know, anywhere between 150 to $100 um, as, as kind of your lowest amount. Um, but again, it's a direct appeal uh, to to get people to to make that direct donation and do it do it live, do it. Um, you know, uh, great auctioneers will, will get the energy going, the clapter, the cheering, uh, and people want to kind of show off. People like their, you know, it's what these donors are there for. Um, so doing it in a live place where they can raise their hand and get acknowledged for it is, is what the name of the game is. So let's see. And then Dr. Um, oh, Dr. Mior Taylor said, or, sh or should we only choose one type of auction? Can we do both during the tournament? Yes, silent auction, uh, golf tournaments. You want to have that at the beginning and during and at the end, just have those bid sheets out there. Or if you're doing mobile bidding, live auction, uh, it's good to have after it's all over. Uh, let's see. We've, let's see, Anthony um, is asking about the iWave subscription service. We find many donors to our mission are elderly people who refer to pay with checks. How do you handle that during auctions and other fundraising events? 
Um, look, money is money, in my opinion. Uh, if people want to pay by checks, then, then more power to them. The more important piece is whether you're collecting that information about them so that you can um, follow up with them and put them through iWave to enrich their data and, and find out if it's something that is worth following up with them on a recurring basis. Um, I see no problem with paying in checks. Did you want to talk about the subscri subscription service there, uh, Trent? Yeah, Anthony, it, it, uh, it is a subscription service, so it's an annual um, annual license for just for access to uh, a wealth, I don't like using that term, but I haven't figured out a better term for it, a wealth, wealth of information that we use to kind of support um, and facilitate those three keys. So we can definitely follow up with you. We've got uh, a few different subscription options there, but it is a subscription service with online access. Great. Great. And we're going to finish up with this question from Pauletta. Um, how much should we do the bid increments at? I had it at $5 and I've changed it to $10 increments. Um, it's going to be it's 15, going to be pushing that, or should we make it higher for those trips and higher levels? Um, Paul, it totally depends um, on your audience and what auction you're talking about. Uh, but she makes a great point about bid increments for the silent auction absolutely have predetermined bid increments. Don't let people write anything in. Um, I see it all the time where you know, there's no bid increments and then people start competing dollar for dollar, which is not what you should be doing. You should have those predetermined bid increments of 10, 15, even $20. I don't think it's pushing it, depending on your audience and people's spending capacity, um, to you know, ask people to kind of bid up uh, you know, between, I would say just between 10 and 20. It also depends on the item. If it's more, the more expensive the item, the, the higher the bid increment, right? If it's a if it's a fifteen hundred dollar um, travel package, right, or hotel stay, then fifty dollar bid increments is not is not you know uh, out of the question, right? Um, for the live auction, uh, it totally depends, uh, and and typically you you know if you have a professional benefit auction year, they'll be the ones establishing the bid increments, but those can be in the hundreds of dollars, right? Um, those can even be. $500 or even $1,000 if it's a $10,000 package, um, it, it just depends on the value of the item. So, um, but but I think she brought up, you know, Paula brought, brought up a good point in term about bid increments and in, in the fact that they should act, absolutely be there, especially for silent auction items. Cool, I think that's it. <laughs> Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. I hope it was informative. Um, if you have any questions at all, you see my email up on the screen there. Don't hesitate to reach out to me uh, if you'd like to learn more about Windspire. Um, we'll be sending out a recording after this, probably sometime tomorrow, uh, with a recording and the slides, um, and also throw uh, you know uh, Trent's contact in there if you if you'd like as well, Trent. Um, but we'd love to hear from you guys and thank you so much for joining us. Stay tuned for part two coming up on September 5th. We're going to talk all about how to get those, get to know those donors and, and use iWave to do that. Yes. Thanks everyone. And thanks Ian for, for your time today. Um, and as Ian mentioned, keep your eyes open for, uh, for the invitation for part two. Great. Awesome, everyone. Thank you so much. Take care now. Have a great day.